Diese Konferenz uh, wird nun aufgezeichnet. Sorry, it was just for the recording. That's okay. So this is uh, my first uh, webinar experience as a uh, presenter, a speaker. Uh, so I hope uh, you'll be uh, appreciating uh, this uh, experience. Um, so I'm an, a nutritionist and I'm a food scientist uh, working at uh, L'Allemand, which is a, a company that I will pre be presenting to you um, when I start my presentation. Um, I've been working in the food industry uh, my whole uh, career and um, they, uh, probably the amazing thing about my, my training is it allows me to understand the effect of uh, food processing in the nutritional and the digestibility effect on, uh, on, on the food that are being uh, offered to consumers, so, so bread. In this case, I've been um, involved in the baking industry for the last five years. I think it's uh, really interesting to um, to be looking at this uh, this product, which is a staple food. Everybody eats bread, and uh, I'm based out of North America, so uh, my my knowledge of, of of bread making is is tainted by the fact that I'm living in North America. But I've had the chance to uh, visit Europe um, quite often, and and being introduced to the bread culture in in Europe, and especially in Germany, because we have some factories in Germany and. I'm very much amazed by the uh, the quality of, of the bread that is um, being offered there. So uh, without any uh, further uh, comments, I will be uh, starting my presentation, which uh, topic is on uh, managing short term and long term uh, bread softness. Um, because of the uh, format of the webinar, uh, normally I would I would have been presenting our company uh, at the end of the presentation, and really it's the idea is to 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 do it short, but it's just to give you an idea of uh, what's behind me when I'm I'm talking to you about this uh, this topic. Uh, because at the end of the uh, webinar, we'll do a question and answer session uh, with two of my colleagues that are very knowledgeable about uh, bread making, uh, and uh, so we'll have a chance to maybe uh, discuss what was uh, presented and um, and hear uh, some of the concerns you may have and maybe solutions that, that exist. So for the quick uh, overview of our, um, oops, sorry, uh, for some reason. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, when I press enter, it doesn't change the slides that are being presented. So I'm just gonna hold on a second. I apologize for this. Okay. Let's try this. Okay, here we are. Okay, so for those of you who uh, do not know Lalamond, it's a, a company that was founded in uh, in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, uh, by a, a person named Alfred Schura, who immigrated from um, Alsace region in France. And he arrived at the end of the 19th century and was always involved in uh, baking ingredients. At one point, he was uh, producing uh, beef tallow and um, he got interested in uh, yeast production um, in 1915. And that's when he started to, um, you know, trial, do some trials on fermentation and larger scales. And in the end, he was able to start, you know, commercializing his product in uh, 1923. And um, it was always a family owned company. Uh, when he passed away, his son took over. And um, uh, in the 1950s, it's the Shango family that, uh, acquired the, the company. And today, Lalamon is really an uh, international company. Uh, we hire more than 4,500 employees and we have factories all over the world, uh, but several of them are based in, in Europe, in Germany, in Austria, in Denmark. And uh, so we, we really are a company with a global uh, presence. Um, we are really focused on 
uh, developing ingredients that are made with microorganisms. So our core is with yeast and bacteria, but we also have other microorganisms and can do derivatives of, of these. And over the years, we uh, diversified our applications. Uh, so at the beginning, we were doing uh, baker's yeast. And so this was our, our main activities. Uh, but throughout the years, we started to uh, develop products for animal nutrition, uh, to make beer, to make wine. Uh, even more recently, we got involved in the, the preparation of uh, uh, cocoa and coffee beans because there is a fermentation process that's going on behind that. And uh, we can offer some uh, microorganisms to, to support the process. Uh, we are really an R&D driven company. We, um, we will always try to uh, push the limit in terms of um, process, uh, productivity, efficacy, uh, but also we, we spend a lot of time uh, studying how our ingredients are used in food applications or in brewing application and baking applications so that we, um, we have the best solutions to, to offer. As I mentioned earlier, we have factories uh, all over uh, the world. In, in Europe, uh, we, we see, for instance, uh, that we uh, have uh, grown quite, uh, our presence has grown quite a lot, uh, starting in the years uh, 2000. So before that, we were mostly a North American-based company. Uh, but then starting in the year 2000, we, we really uh, got our footprint in, um, in Europe. These are the uh, type of ingredients that we are manufacturing and that we can, we can offer. But as you see, they're all based on yeast and bacteria. Uh, so for instance, we, we do baker's yeast, uh, which is dry or fresh, uh, but we also do um, uh, bacteria for sourdough and also aromatic yeast that can help increase the aroma and the taste of, of bread. Uh, we also have nutritional yeast that are enriched with uh, vitamin D or uh, zinc, and that can be used to enrich food to make them a source of these uh, nutrients. Uh, we also offer uh, and uh, manufacture some uh, enzymes uh, that can be used in baking. Uh, we also are um, uh, involved in the preparation of ingredients that can help in the conservation of, of bread. Uh, and we also have, uh, for instance, yeast that's rich in glutathione, so that uh, can be used to help relax the dough in, in various applications, reducing the mixing time and things like that. Uh, so this is the list of the uh, factories where um, we are active. Uh, so I've, I've mentioned a few already, but also uh, we have factories in South Africa and the UK and Denmark and Estonia. So, uh, and then in Europe, we have uh, two research labs, one in the Netherlands and one in Portugal. Um, so really our, our focus is on industrial uh, baking. Uh, we do have insights and solutions for um, artisan uh, bakeries, uh, but for sure our or is uh, with industrial bakeries. And uh, so we have a lot of know-how and, 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 and uh, experience in solving problems uh, for these types of uh, bakeries. And, um, and we are you know, capable of doing solu developing solutions that can be customized to uh, process and uh, to help the bakeries uh, you know, get them the best out of their, their efforts. So truly, uh, if you think of lawnmower baking, we're, we're driven by innovation, by applications. That's that's our motto, and this is how we uh, we do our business. And uh, this is just uh, pictures to show you the type of uh, applications where we are uh, involved. Since you know we're North American uh, based originally, uh, we are really strong on pan bread. But this is also an application that. Uh, is important in some countries in Europe, uh, but we have a strong experiences also in artisanal uh, sourdough rye bread and uh, also on the viennoiseries like croissants and uh, cakes and um, bagels and pizza doughs and so on and so forth. Um, so that's just to finish our, our company presentation. Uh, this is a, a quote <coughs> that was... Uh, given by our uh, the founder of uh, Lallemande, Alfred Scherer. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So in uh, 1938, when he was um, interviewed by Baker's Journal, which is a, a, a trade journal in, uh, in Canada, uh, he mentioned how, uh, you know, the 
success of his company was totally dependent on the success of his uh, his customers and his bakery customers and this is a, a motto that's that is still driving our our activities at Lalamon that everywhere we're doing it whether it's it's for our our, our baking partners or for our brewing partners and uh, customers that are using our products for winemaking. This is, has always been uh, what is driving us, is uh, the cooperation. And the cooperation is with our customers, but it can be also with research centers, institutes that are going to help us understand, you know, the effect of our products. Um, so with that introduction in mind, now we can focus on the <laughs> topic uh, that was proposed uh, for you today, which is on uh, bread staling and how to manage uh, softness, uh, short term and long term, uh, because there there are issues. It's not um, it's not a uh, a new topic, a new concern, but uh, the issues uh, remain, and we like I like to go over those issues and maybe uh, define certain terms that maybe some of you are not familiar with and understand how we measure uh, bread staling and what are the causes. And then we'll turn to the uh, existing solutions and uh, what are the uh, future uh, solutions that um, that can be envisioned in uh, dealing with uh, bread staling. Uh, so what's the issue when you're thinking of uh, fresh keeping? Uh, well, there, yes, there's the uh, molding and there's, uh, uh, you know, that 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 uh, growth of, of microorganisms that that's going to prevent uh, consumers from you know eating the product uh, but before that there is also the the issue of the uh, the bread crumb softness that disappears over time uh, there's also issues with um, gumminess of the crumb and some some losses that can occur during slicing uh, because of the poor uh, bread texture. And also uh, upon distribution, uh, are you allowed to stack bread? And if you do, uh, you know, is it being deformed because it lacks the resilience? So these are all issues that are related to uh, bread staling. Now at the consumer level, uh, we also have some big challenges because the consumers are always asking for the freshest flavored uh, products. Although uh, the product was made uh, maybe uh, 10 days ago, when they're buying it, for them, they, they view it as, as something fresh. And they expect that it's going to, you know, taste and feel fresh, you know, for a few few days when they, they keep it at home. Uh, and that's uh, unfortunate because over time with staling, we see that the bread lose their aroma, the crumb becomes crumblier. And so it's, it's not acceptable for consumers. And that explains why staling is uh, the cause of uh, so much uh, bread waste and bread returns. Uh, I found a study, uh, it was actually a master thesis that was done by um, a, a German and in 2011. And so the results were published in the 2012. And you see the, um, the reason why uh, people uh, will be, uh, you know, uh, you know, throwing away uh, food at home. And, uh, you know, 28% of the um, of the consumers that were um, that were uh, surveyed uh, said that they would throw away food due to a bad smell or bad taste, and so that's quite a significant amount. And if you think about the type of food that is usually uh, wasted at the household level in Germany, bread is on the top uh, is uh, you know second uh, top onto the list after uh, fruit and vegetables. Uh, Forty seven percent of bread and the bakery products are, are, are being wasted. Now, uh, the, uh, the study was also uh, looking at the uh, retail level, the waste that was happening at the retail level. And uh, it shows that for uh, the, um, the, the food, uh, German re uh, retail uh, food stores, uh, they will uh, tend to have 11% of loss in revenues, which is due to uh, packaging breakage or uh, spoilage and uh, if if this amount is uh, being converted to uh, food waste kilo per capita uh, in Germany you see that the the German uh, retail food uh, companies they will waste something around uh, 6.1 kilogram uh, per capita uh, which is quite significant and if you think that 
um, you know, 11% of that is uh, is bakery items that are, are have to be uh, thrown away. It represents uh, about uh, 650 uh, grams per, of uh, bread per capita, so uh, not uh, an insignificant amount. Uh, so there's 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 really a, a motivation, I think, to to do something about it, especially with the the green deal that's uh, taking effect uh, in in Europe. Um, companies will be more and more asked to uh, to do uh, something to reduce waste and reduce the pollution in, in, in by any means. Uh, so for those of you maybe are not familiar with the, the term and that's what uh, draw you to the, the conference this, uh, this afternoon, bread staling is defined as the, the changes that take place naturally in bread when it starts to age. And uh, those changes, unfortunately, make the bread uh, undesirable to consumers. So there are several signs that you uh, you can observe. Uh, and uh, you know, like me, for instance, before I, I, I start to be involved in in our baking uh, activities at Lalamon, I I was not aware of bread staling. I, I didn't pay attention to it. I but you know, it's 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 clearly defined that you see the bread crumb crumb structure starts to change and it becomes firm. Uh, it's less springy, less elastic, and they starts to crumble. There makes a lot of waste uh, on your um, slicer or in the at home on the slicing uh, board. And uh, we see that the crust also has lost its crispiness and the fragrance of the bread is, is kind of changed. It, the, the aroma has evaporated and then you have the appearance of the stale aroma that's uh, taking over. Uh, why is it happening? Uh, what is really happening? Uh, well, uh, it's it's mainly uh, due to the change of the uh, starch components in the in the flour that or that was hydrated during the uh, dough preparation and then was baked, jellified uh, during the baking process. And afterwards, what happens is that the uh, the starch molecules is trying to revert to its original structure. So uh, it's it's really uh, mostly the amylopectin that uh, that we see on the graph, which is on the uh, right hand side. We see that really opened up, swelled really nicely, and uh, was you know you know contributing to the uh, the bread volume and the crumb structure. <clears throat> and over time. Uh, it will uh, try the the strands of the the amylopectin are going to try to uh, get close again, and by doing that, it this is what is uh, affecting the the crumb firmness. Uh, there's also um, a process that's happening that's affecting the starch is the uh, water molecule that's uh, moving around in the bread, and you'll see, for instance, that because the crust is so dry and the crumb is so moist. You see that the nature is always trying to equilibrate itself. So uh, the uh, crumb is going to try to hydrate the crust, and the crust is going to tr try to uh, dry the crumb. So basically, uh, the two of them to to reach an equilibrium. And so that's why the uh, crust is becoming softer, and uh, also the the crumb is becoming drier. Uh, and due to that, you also have the evaporation that takes place, you know, uh, as, uh, you know, the bread is being packaged in, in, into something that's not necessarily airtight, you may uh, see some moisture loss that's uh, occurring. And with the moisture loss often uh, goes away the uh, volatile aromatic compounds that contribute to the nice fresh uh, aroma of, uh, of bread. Um, so when is staling taking place? Uh, well, it really starts at the end of the baking process, so when it comes out of the oven. Uh, so you see in the picture here uh, in the dough stage, you know, the amylopectin, uh, you know, arms are all curdled together. We add water, we, uh, we hydrate the starch, and we see that the, the strands of the amylopectin is all spread out, open, and, and great. And as, as we're, we're, uh, we're um, aging the bread, then the, the strands of amylopectin are trying to revert back to their original um, uh, position. Uh, but, and, and that explains why if you're reheating the bread, you know, you're putting it in the toaster, which I often do, uh, we see that the, there's going to be a softening effect of uh, that's taking place. <clears throat> uh, 
so uh, the temperature has a huge impact on uh, bread staling. So uh, if you're keeping the bread between, uh, you know, early freezing temperatures, minus seven to 10 degrees Celsius, we start uh, to see an increase in the bread uh, crumb firmness. Uh, if you're, however, keeping your bread at a temperature higher than 35 degrees C, which is the temperature, you know, uh, temperatures where uh, bread is coming out of the oven, we see that the, um, you know, it's uh, it's keeping the uh, the the crumb soft and and moist. However, by doing that, if you're keeping it at that temperature uh, for a long uh, period of time, then you 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 risk affecting the color and the flavor, and you also risk. Uh, uh, allowing some microorganism to grow. So unfortunately, that temperature storage is not an issue, uh, an option. So that's why it's recommended to uh, store bread uh, temperatures between 20 and 35 degrees Celsius to uh, keep the most optimum uh, softness. Uh, now, maybe wondering how to uh, monitor uh, bread staling in, in your bread and see like how it does, how's, how's, the, how's the softness and the, the, the crumb firmness of your bread coming out of the oven and how, how that's going to evolve over time. Uh, well, at our bake lab, we uh, use a texture analyzer and that's going to give us uh, quite a lot of uh, information. So on the crumb uh, firmness, but also on the crumb uh, and the bread resilience and the resilient means the um, the resistance <clears throat> of the uh, of the the bread structure to uh, to pressure uh, physical pressure is it gonna uh, is it when it's it's being uh, pressurized is it gonna uh, return to its original shape or not uh, and that uh, this is a really important component if you you're thinking of uh, having your bread distributed and you have to stack it well if your your crumb is too soft uh, you may have a problem in terms of resilience where your bread is going to be compacted compressed and unfortunately will have a hard time returning to its original shape which is undesirable uh, another uh, important uh, measurement for uh, bread staling is the uh, organoleptic uh, characteristics. So you need to do sensory evaluation uh, by a test, uh, a test panel to evaluate the taste, the aroma, and the mouthfeel. I mean, the mouthfeel is is maybe like kind of a subjective analysis of what we're getting out of the texture analyzer. So, uh, but it's also going to give you really important information about you know, the dryness of the crumb, the crumbliness, uh, is it soggy, is it gummy, is it tooth packing, is it staying in the in the consumer uh, teeth, and that's, that's not a desirable uh, characteristic. And sometimes if you have too much softness and um, not enough resilience, you may uh, detect this by uh, the gumminess and the tooth packing effect you have in the, in the mouthfeel. Um, so now if we turn to the uh, solutions uh, that are available, uh, what are we targeting uh, basically when we want to uh, slow down uh, bread staling is, is uh, controlling the, uh, the starch molecule, how they move and whether they're going to be crystallizing. So uh, reverting back to their original stranded uh, uh, molecular structure. So if we're able to uh, prevent the starch molecule from, from changing its uh, structure, then we're able to control uh, bread staling or slow it down, basically. Uh, we cannot stop it completely, but really slow it down. There, there are several solutions. So uh, the uh, amylose molecule, <clears throat> we can also prevent that from uh, going to a retrogradation, and also the uh, amylopectin. So uh, if we look at what are the uh, solutions in terms of process, well, I've uh, really uh, talked about the uh, storage conditions and how it's important to avoid uh, low temperature. And um, you know, if 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 you know you need to have an extended uh, storage, uh, then you you should uh, consider the freezing uh, because this at least is uh, is there's no staling taking place when you're at temperature below uh, 15 degrees Celsius. Um, mentioning you know not not over uh, heating the bread. So if you you're able to keep enough moisture in the in the bread so if you you can target like a level of 38 degree uh, moisture level 
um, that is also something that, that can help in, in slowing down uh, bread staling. Um, there's also, you know, uh, um, the importance of, uh, of, of managing the amount of uh, bread preservative that you might be adding in your bread formula. Some bakeries are adding, uh, for instance, uh, calcium propionate or some sorbates. And so <clears throat> the, the, there's, the, there's the, the if you're if you're adding a lot of uh, preservative to have your bread keep for 40 days, uh, well, the softness uh, and the anti-staling solution have to match that because if you you might be able to get, uh, you know, 90 days uh, softness, but if your bread is molding, then there's no no point in, 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 uh, in doing that. Um, there's also uh, the fermentation process that you can look to uh, improve or modify because the uh, pH level and the titrable um, acid level and the uh, enzyme activity uh, that is uh, is very uh, important during fermentation these we're going are going to have an impact on the uh, rate of staling that's going to take place <clears throat> and then last but least but of course very important is the the type of packaging that you're going to be using uh, if if you do an airtight or atmospheric controlled uh, packaging, uh, you're also going to be impacting the uh, bread staling. Now, if we look at uh, bakery ingredients, uh, there are several ingredients that can impact uh, bread staling. Uh, so um, ingredients that have hydrocolloid uh, properties uh, are going to bound water. And by doing that, <clears throat> the uh, water is less available to migrate. Uh, so from, you know, the water that's trapped into the, the jellified uh, starch molecules uh, is, is not going to be able to move from the crumb to the crust. And, and so that's going to help uh, to minimize the amount of uh, starch crystallization that could be taking place. Fat can also have uh, an impact on the uh, bread staling, but it's mostly for the initial uh, softness level. So when, when you're, you're talking about uh, you know the sliceability of your bread and and how soft it is you know in the first uh, three three days maybe and it's uh it's really uh, has an impact on the on the short bite so um for this is ingredient it's it's maybe more for for short-term uh, management and uh, now there are also several types of emulsifiers that can be used and uh, how they work is they they will complex with the uh, starch, um, amylose starch molecules, and uh, they're like kind of wrapping it, and uh, and that's also uh, is going to have an impact on the uh, early uh, softness uh, level of, of the bread. Now uh, there are also enzymes that can impact uh, the short-term softness and the long-term softness, and we're going to see a little bit further uh, why. And uh, finally, uh, if you consider uh, that during the fermentation process, there are several uh, molecules that are being generated by the enzymatic activity of uh, the sourdough bacteria and the yeast bacteria, uh, yeast, and uh, these uh, metabolites uh, can have an impact on the um, on the flavor uh, profile of the bread, and that that can help counteract the uh, the development of the of the stale smell. So all these are can be considered bakery ingredients uh, solutions for uh, fresh keeping. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with the term hydrocolloid, it's it's like kind of a, a grouping uh, focusing on a, on a function. And so, as I mentioned before, it's it's binding with water. So which type of ingredients have hydrocolloid uh, properties? There are the sugars, the syrup, uh, eggs, uh, milk, uh, pectin, uh, cellulose. So those that are uh, fiber or uh, that have a lot of uh, simple uh, sugars. And uh, the, uh, they are really uh, used to uh, impact on flavor, but also they have a big impact on, on uh, texture. And sometimes this is one of the reasons why uh, you can see such high levels of, of sugar in some bread formulation. Uh, I remember Subway was being asked if, the, if, uh, if uh, their bread should be really considered bread because they, they have, I think, 12% uh, sugar in, the, in their formulation. So uh, it's, 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 it's always the, the balance of uh, what you're trying to get if it's for um, uh, the, 
the uh, you know the long term stability texture of the product or short term depending on what you're looking for you 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 will use different uh, solutions uh, if we think of the emulsifiers these uh, for industrial bakeries are often the uh, mono and the di uh, diglycerides and uh, what they do is they will wrap around uh, the amylose molecule will wrap around the uh, monoglyceride molecules and by doing that then they're not able to uh, revert back to their straight uh, shape which is the uh, uh, retrograded shape that gives the the crumb uh, firmness <clears throat> now uh, ingredients that are really efficient at managing the uh, crumb softness and preventing slowing down staling are uh, bakery enzymes uh, because they have an impact on the short-term softness uh, of the crumb and also for longer term um, storage. Uh, and how do the enzymes uh, work is by um, uh, breaking down some of the molecules that are involved in staling. So if we consider the amylase molecule, uh, they're going to break down uh, the starch into smaller molecules and uh, by doing that um, it's uh, the the strands of the amylopectin for instance are too short and and by being too short they're not able to to uh, strand together again and and be uh, retrograded and and do crumb uh, soft uh, crumb firmness uh, so there are different types of uh, amylases, uh, and depending on the one that is chosen, uh, you see that the amylopectin uh, uh, branch uh, branches are being cut at different places, and this explains how they're they're going to be able to impact uh, the uh, long-term uh, softness. Uh, and we see that these uh, enzymes they also will be um, active at different temperatures and so some of them you're going are going to be uh, uh, working on at uh, at uh, 60 degrees celsius uh, and while others are going to be denatured so depending on the choice of, of the enzymes uh, it's important to uh, to make uh, you know the choice based on on what you're you're looking for um, there are other enzymes that also are going to take you know the uh, the components that are in the dough and that are going to cut them degrade them in into uh, molecules that can have an impact on bread staling so if you uh, take uh, the enzyme uh, lipase well in a way they they could be used to replace some some of the emulsifiers because uh, they're going to cut the uh, fat molecules in the flour and generate some uh, fatty acids that can that do the same uh, function as emulsifiers do. Uh, the xylanase uh, also can break down some fiber molecules and that are normally uh, damaging the uh, gluten matrix. So these are other enzymes that can be involved in, uh, in the, your fresh keeping solution. <clears throat> Then, as I mentioned, also the fermentation metabolites, uh, so those that are being generated by the enzymatic activity of yeast and of the lactic acid bacteria in sourdough bread, are going to have an impact on the uh, flavor profile. So when you're fermenting, uh, you're generating uh, several compounds like ethanol and secondary um, alcohols, aldehydes and organic acids. And these are all flavor precursors that are giving uh, the nice, typical, fresh, uh, buttery, nutty, roasted uh, flavors that are associated with, you know, uh, fresh bread. So uh, if whether you're doing a long or short-term fermentation, the presence of these molecules are going to be uh, present. And uh, if, uh, if you're doing a short fermentation time, uh, there's a possibility to add some uh, um, microorganisms that are going to come and help support generate more of the aromas. Uh, now, if we think about what's the future of uh, bakery ingredients and solution to help extend bread uh, freshness and softness, uh, well, the way we see it, it's really in the combination of solutions, because by <clears throat> by doing that, you're able to uh, generate some synergies and uh, our experience has been uh, quite with uh, with fermentations 
solution uh, for sure as we are uh, you know <laughs> manufacture of microorganisms and microorganisms ferment uh, we've we've uh, we've studied that and, and looked at that quite at length and uh, we we saw that uh, there are several uh, benefits in combining uh, for instance uh, our bakery enzymes and our uh, levain sardo cultures and our aromatic yeast by doing that you're able to to get the desired softness and the resilience for good uh, sliceability and good stackability, and also get a really nice fresh bread aroma, uh, which is probably something desirable uh, when you, you want your consumer to experience the, the aroma uh, when the bread is coming out of the, of the oven, for instance, like in an in-store bakery or something like that. Uh, but for longer term uh, freshness solution, um, the enzymes are definitely providing the uh, the effect on the on the softness, and uh, we see that uh, some of our uh, uh, microorganisms can help to uh, support the bread flavor for a longer period of time. Uh, just to show you some some examples of of work we've done uh, on some on some different bread formula. Here in this case, it's a white sandwich bread, and uh, which was um, uh, formulated with our uh, maltogenic amylase enzyme. And uh, we see that uh, we really get a, a, a significant uh, improvement of the uh, bread resilience at seven day, and uh, also the, crum the crumb uh, firmness is reduced. So these are all the uh, desirable uh, attributes that you're uh, you're looking for. Uh, there's uh, also uh, the combination of our enzyme with uh, some uh, aromatic yeast, and uh, we see that uh, by enriching the bread formula, we're able to increase the level of certain uh, aromatic compounds, uh, which are listed on the uh, left hand side, and that are going to be contributing, for instance, to the uh, roasted, fret, uh, fruity, whiskey, banana, uh, molasses, floral, uh, bready, honey flavors. So uh, just by adding uh, a little bit of these aromatic yeast, uh, you're able to really impact uh, positively the, uh, the aroma of the uh, bread. Now we also uh, tested the combination of our enzymes with our uh, starter cultures, uh, um, sourdough starter cultures. And we see uh, in this uh, rye sourdough bread formulation, um, we uh, get a really nice effect on the, uh, the texture, the crumb resilience, the way the crumb is, is more cohesive, more uniform and uh, moist. And uh, we saw that the softness at seven days and even at uh, 12 days was uh, significantly improved. Um, we wanted to show you uh, at the end of our presentation, we wanted to show you a, a video that we did on uh, fresh keeping. Uh, unfortunately, with the, the webinar platform, it's not possible to, um, to show it. But just to let you know that we have a, a YouTube channel and uh, that's where we uh, we show uh, all the videos that we generate. So over time, if we uh, if we uh, uh, have a new one, this is where it would be posted. And so the the fresh keeping video that uh, we have here, I'm actually gonna copy paste this link and and put it in the um, the chatting uh, device that we have on the platform so that you can uh, you can view it. It's it's two minutes or 2.5 minutes. So please feel free to uh, to go and look at it. And uh, also, if you have uh, questions or uh, you want to exchange about uh, what was uh, presented to you today, please uh, do not hesitate to reach out to me or to, uh, to my colleague Vu, who's our, our key account manager, and will be happy to answer your question. Uh, and this now opens the floor for our question session. So I will, uh, I, I, I would invite you if you feel comfortable to open your cameras and uh, open your mic and let's have a, uh, and you know, and try, let's try to have a normal conversation if uh, possible. And um, uh, we, uh, we can continue the uh, discussion.
So I don't know if uh, Tobias, at this it point, do we many, stop sharing my computer? Maybe do, yeah, do we stop seeing my, my screen? Yeah, many thanks, thanks for your lecture at first, Jacint. Uh, I will change the moderator. Wait a moment. No problem. So now we can uh, see all of us a little bit better. Super. And I apologize if you heard my my son in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, I think it's quite normal in, in times doing. of home office, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, 64 participants, are there any questions to the lecture of Chassent? I think there is one, wait a moment. Can you talk about enzymes in cakes and muffins? How much shelf life we can achieve by using enzymes? It's one question. Marcel, who's our expert in uh, baking application, maybe uh, you, if yeah, you have uh, something we're to still say? Busy, uh, with, with investigate, but we have done, uh, in, uh, especially in muffins and pound cakes, I think we can extend the shelf life uh, to, to at least to a month, I think, and maybe even further. Uh, and that, uh, But that's not only based on multigenic emulases, but also based on other enzymes like uh, lipases so it's really a synergy which you need uh, where you can achieve uh, the right softness but the problem is that we always need to uh, develop a custom-made solution because cake recipes has uh, yeah you have many different types eh? you have um, high sugar and low ratio low sugar ratio cakes uh, different fat and flour levels so all the ratios in cakes are, are so different but uh, yeah we have achieved very good results in uh, non-aerated cakes like muffins and pound cakes uh, with uh, with enzymes. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Tobias? Yeah. Uh, it, it wasn't mine. It was the question of Mr. Huntius. Uh, I think he will ask again if there is something open. Okay. Uh, perfect. <laughs> uh, Annelies Annelies Fora uh, asks which parameters you measure with the texture analyzer. Yeah, we, we can do, uh, yeah, of course, uh, springiness, resilience, and of course, firmness. And we are looking as well to crumb strength to find a method. But uh, in our opinion, the, the sensory evaluation is also very important. We have many customers. Uh, so the large baking groups, they are in contact with retailers. And often the re retailers would like to have a sensory evaluation. So then you really need the panel to, to, to uh, get uh, the consumer's opinion. So uh, texture analyzer is fine if it can uh, confirm the results from uh, the sensory panel, in our opinion. Yeah, but we're really uh, searching for methods uh, to make the texture analyzer more reproducible, and and yeah, you really need to uh, uh, optimize your method to to do to get a good measurement on the texture analyzer. Okay. Are there further questions? So there are many people in the room and I think there um, could be many questions too. Yeah, I have a quick question about the, uh, the start culture. Is there, if you, can we use the start culture on the street dough process instead of the sourdough? Will that have any benefit Kind of to provide that sourdough flavor. I mean, because it's so short, right? Only like no, no, you know, 16 no, that, minutes. That's, yeah, yeah that, that, that's too short. If you have a straight dough, uh, yeah, we are busy with some developments with maybe you can make it in situ, but then you still need to, uh, uh, a solution. But we have, Lollamont has a unique starter culture, which is the L77, uh, which has an effect with five to six hours fermentation, and that's already short. Uh, a normal fermentation time of the starter culture is around uh, 16 to 24 hours to get a result. So uh, with starter cultures, normally you, re you really need a, a long fermentation, but Lallemand has a unique product, which is the L77, which needs around five to six hours. Yeah, yeah I, I, do, uh, I do a while you have the L77, uh, uh, but you know, it's, it's kind of a, a challenge, especially, you know, most of uh, uh, our bakery is a street dough process, you know. The, yes. I to stay away with the sourdough. So that's kind of, you know, how can yeah, we 
you know, yeah, you have four hours, can you continue to improve like uh, three hours then to get like one hour? That will be benefit for the whole industry, especially in North America. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course, if, if you look to our uh, aromatic yeast, but of course, that's not the sourdough. In, in combinations with the sourdough uh, made with our starter cultures, that could give you, uh, of course, a an, an, an big difference in taste and flavor. Uh, and of course, we're working on these concepts, which you can use for a stray dough. Uh, yeah, that, that will be the future. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. So, Marek Gillig is asking, can you describe uh, the connection between the bread staling and alcohol addition during packing? Oh, that, that's just uh, that's just for uh, as, as a preservative, huh, the alcohol addition in, in the packaging. Or do you ta ask a different question? Just Yeah, that, it, this would be for uh, anti-molding effect, not for yes. uh, softness. However, sometimes when they add uh, alcohol in the packaging, the, the softness becomes also slightly better. That's mm -hmm. our experience, yeah. Okay, Francesca Gallio is asking from a legal point of view, can we continue to consider enzymes for bakery applications as process aids and so, so we don't have to label them? Good question. That's a good just question. To... Yeah. Maybe I can share just on the North American side, uh, we, we are exposed to a uh, varying regulatory environment. So in Canada, the bakery enzymes have to be declared, whereas in uh, the States, they don't have to be. And I think in Mexico, they, they have to be declared. So just wanted to share that. Yeah, yeah we still wait for the European Union and then that can take uh, yeah m even more than five to ten years. but. Uh, yeah, it's uncertain uh, what's going to happen uh, in that sense, and yeah, we, re need, we really need to secure then that uh, the bread has no re the real enzyme activity uh, left. But uh, we know that flour or malt flours can contain as well uh, very heat stable enzymes eh, from nature. So I don't know, uh, uh, yeah, what's going to happen in the future. Mm. So that's a bit uncertain. <laughs> Okay, and the next question is, does the aromatic yeast has also any effect of proving or only an aromatic effect? It depends on the type. Sometimes it has a, a little bit uh, a gas production as well, and then you can uh, reduce the, the normal baker's yeast. Uh, but of course, that's uh, uh, different per, per uh, aromatic yeast. So we have a very large data bank on aromatic yeast eh, because we are... Uh, in the wine and brewing uh, business, uh, so we have uh, many choices. Uh, uh, so yeah, and also there we, we try to uh, enhance the flavors from our aromatic yeast with, with other uh, ingredients from Lallemand, like our yeast uh, uh, extracts and proteins, which uh, has a uh, unique uh, uh, amino acid composition which can influence the taste. So there are p more possibilities and. Yeah, uh, when the potential is high, we're always willing to to work on a uh, uh, consumer-made uh, solution with our customers. Yeah. Thank you. Are there further questions in the room? So if there are no further questions, um, I repeat what I wrote in the, in the chat room at the be beginning. Uh, if you want to have the recording of uh, this lecture of Chassant, uh, you should send me an email. Uh, it uh, lasts an hour or so until it's finished, and I will send you a link to download uh, the presentation and the recording uh, afterwards. There is another question from Dr. Hartl. How do the wheat quality and the flour influence the shelf life? Yeah, of course, uh, if you have, uh, that it has also to do with milling. Eh? Sometimes if you have more uh, damaged starch available from the milling mat or less damaged starch, uh, then that can have an influence on the crystallization, retardation of starch. And that can have an influence on your on your fresh keeper. And also a, a poor quality, poor flower quality uh, could give you uh, thicker cell walls in the final bread, for example, but has, which has also an influence on your on your final staling. 
So yeah, flower quality could have an influence on your staling. Yeah. So, yeah. So just to uh, build on that question on the damaged starch. Uh, yeah. So if uh, during the the how to say the baking, do you know how much the starch is gelatinized? Oh, you know that's kind of have. You, because it, the damaged starch it do you know will degrade it right sometimes it help you for the fermentation but yes it also have another effect yeah yeah of course starch uh, will gelatinize uh, normally wheat starch between 60 and 65 degrees celsius eh? mm -hmm. um, but that of course uh, yeah, you can maybe delay that a little bit with enzymes, uh, the gelatinization point a little bit, and then, mm -hmm. then that could have an influence as well on your uh, softness effect, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if there is any study, for example, the, the low damage uh, flour, low damage starch flour and high damage starch flour, then do a mm -hmm. study that will be a good good study. Yes. Yeah, because anyway, it could be... You, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it could be if you have more starch available, uh, mm -hmm. then maybe the staling goes faster as well. Eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that? Uh... It makes sense. Yeah. OK. Any other questions? Yeah, and maybe I can yeah. ask another question. You yeah. know, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. so we sometimes we feel like you know the gaminis. How can we improve that? The, the gaminis with you know the texture. The gaminis, yeah, mm -hmm. that has, has also a lot to do with with the uh, enzymes as well, and of course sometimes uh, uh, with the flower quality as well, and the addition of of malt flowers and other items. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, if I look to our maltogenic MLAs compared to others, then uh, we see a, a benefit uh, in gumminess and springiness and foldiness of the product. And yeah, it, it's really uh, uh, the character of the enzyme which can make a difference there. Mm -hmm. And we know that uh, often they say it's one maltogenic MLAs. You see often combinations in the market which has as well a little bit of bacterial MLAs, and that will give you the gumminess then. Uh, but also some multigenic amylases are a little bit more heat stable, which can cause uh, gumminess. So it's really uh, uh, good to to make a, the right choice in your enzymes. Uh, we know that it's very complicated, but uh, it's important to run uh, yeah many trials uh, to define the right uh, enzyme for your uh, desired quality attributes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there more questions? So it seems not so. And thanks again to Chassant and all your colleagues of uh, Le Mans uh, for offering this webinar to, to our customers, to our participants, to our uh, members. Um, stay healthy, all of you. Have a nice day in the US and a uh, nice evening in Europe. OK, thanks. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.